listen to better than you will any other probably that I ever present. Since we're having video tapes made, you might want to not worry about taking notes tonight and listen real well. And also, before this all over, I'll get you an outline of this lesson as far as the hard names and places are concerned. We have to step into history a little bit tonight. There's no way we can keep from it in this 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Some people call these the 400 silent years, meaning that inspiration was silent. We had no books between Malachi and Matthew that were inspired of God, like the 39 Old Testament books and the 27 New Testament books. But I can assure you quickly the urgent importance of this lesson. But if I were you, I believe I would listen thoroughly tonight and not worry about taking notes. And you might want to get the video of this series or wait until I get you an outline with a lot of these names and places spelled out. We're in uncharted territory tonight for a lot of people. There are a lot of members of the church who have been members of the church for half a century that have never studied the interbiblical period. Most of them will say it's not important. I'm going to prove to you in a hurry it's not only important, it's essential. And then I'm going to prove to you that God in heaven expected us to learn this. Can I prove that? In a hurry. In John 10, 22, in the New Testament, it says, Now it was the Feast of Dedication. You can look in the Old Testament for every feast that's mentioned from Genesis through Malachi, and you'll never find the Feast of Dedication. But since the Holy Spirit inspired John to write in John 10, 22, it was the Feast of Dedication. I know from that that heaven intended for us to know about this period because you'll never know what John 10, 22 means till you study what we're studying tonight. Why did Jesus, in the first four chapters of Mark, heal people and say, don't tell anybody? But in Mark 5, he healed a man and said, you go tell everybody. You'll never understand that if you don't study this period we're studying tonight. Why was Jesus intensely hated just before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and for just a little while they praised him, and immediately after hated him even more. You'll never understand that dilemma and that problem unless you study what we're studying tonight. Where'd the Pharisees and Sadducees come from? They're all over the New Testament. You don't read about them in the Old Testament. Where'd the Epicureans and Stoics come from that Christ and the apostles warred against spiritually? Where'd the synagogues come from? It never ceases to amaze me how we just take these things for granted, have no background to them, don't know who they are, where they came from. We don't even know what Paul meant when he stood up in Acts 23 in the presence of the Sanhedrin and said, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm a Pharisee. What does that mean? Why did Jesus say to the religious elite, the Sadducees in Mark 12, 24, you do greatly err, not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God. Why could Paul say to Agrippa in Acts 26, 5, I was after the most accurate sect of the Jews, a Pharisee. You don't even know what that means. If you don't study the period we're studying tonight, I'm not being rude now. I'm having to prove my case. I wish you did. But I've got every time I teach this lesson, I've got to prove to my brethren that it's the necessary, essential lesson to understand the New Testament and to tie the old and new together. I'll guarantee you, God in heaven wants us, and through the teaching of the New Testament, demands that we study this period of time. Where'd the Herods and Caesars come from? They're all over the New Testament, the life of Christ and the apostles. From Matthew 1 through the book of Acts, particularly, where did they come from? Who were they? Now and only now are we ready to study this. I don't know of a study in the entire scope of Bible study that's as important and imperative and helpful is this one. I can say that truthfully, and I've been studying the Bible for 40 years. I count what we're studying tonight, the link that ties all the Bible together, and without it, you'll have puzzling questions and dilemmas the rest of your life. But with it, new vistas and horizons are opened up immediately, and you begin to put in place things you wondered about all your life. We have boundaries on this. Sure glad I can give you a direct scripture or two right here now. I've already referred to many. Daniel 2.44 is this boundary. 500 years before Christ, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, 
there will be four worldwide dynasties. And thou, O king, are the head of gold in this image. After you will come another kingdom. That was the Medo-Persian empire that conquered Babylon. After that, a third worldwide dynasty, speaking of Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire. And then the fourth one that would conquer Greece. And in the days of those kings, the Roman kings, the fourth worldwide dynasty, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. It will break in pieces all these other kingdoms. It will stand forever. It shall never be destroyed. Daniel said, listen to me. The whole wide world, listen to me. And if you don't get this point, you won't appreciate the day of Pentecost and the days of the Roman kings when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. In Luke 3, verse 1, we have the names of three of those Roman kings and the days of those kings. The God of heaven will set up his kingdom. So five centuries before Christianity came, before the gospel went forth from Pentecost, Daniel foretold these days, but he spanned 500 years to do it. 400 years, four centuries, when there was no revealed will inspired book. Now the other boundary is Galatians 4.4 4 in the New Testament. It says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Romans 5.6 says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What made the time Jesus came due time and fullness of time? Why didn't Jesus come 300 years sooner or 500 years later? Why did he come when he came? Was it just an accident, happenstance? The Bible says it was in the fullness of time. In due time, what made it so? What happened in these intervening centuries to make it the precise time when God sent his son? The Bible answers that, and history answers it. But you've got to tie it all together to appreciate fully. Draw a great big S in your hand. There are three words beginning with the letter S that sum up this period of time. Scattering is the first one, known as the dispersion in the New Testament and in history. The scattering of the Jews, the dispersion of Abraham's seed. The last time we studied about them, they had been in Babylonian captivity because of their sins. They had then been home a hundred years. And in the books of Esther and Malachi, the last epic and saga of Old Testament chronological history, a hundred years after Babylonian captivity, they're worse off spiritually than they were before they went into captivity. They're in the dregs of sin, in the depths of despair, and God's fed up with them. They're even saying it's a tedious thing to worship God. What a weariness is in worshiping God. And they were giving God old, sick, halt, maimed, lame animals they wouldn't even give to the governor of Persia. They're nearly annihilated by Haman, a wicked plotter, in Ahasuerus' uh, days, or Xerxes, in the book of Esther, in the Persian Empire. But God had said Abraham's seed must be preserved until the Savior comes, Genesis 22, 10. And Joseph said, God sent me before you to preserve you, Genesis 45, 5. And Mordecai said to Esther, who knows but what you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this, Esther 4, 14. You better speak up in a hurry or Abraham's seed's gone. God's people were scattered, dispersed. First of all, in Babylon, they built uh, synagogues in the land, Psalm 74, 8, the only time the word synagogues found in the Old Testament, there in a footnote in every translation except the King James. But when the temple was burned, sacked, and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, 2 Kings 25, 9, and they went down to captivity for 70 years that they had deserved, they were born to the temple for the first time. They're hallowed sanctuary if you please and they'd made their sanctuary a cemetery spiritually because they had not worshipped God properly and lived in infamy but when they got down to Babylon they built temporary structures or assembly places called synagogues and they faced them toward Jerusalem meaning that someday we'll go back home in 1915 some archaeologists uncovered an ancient synagogue that had been perfectly preserved petrified, if you please, through the years because of sand they'd blown against it and the winds blown against that. And when they got through the sand and uncovered the debris, they saw on the walls of that ancient synagogue three murals, and every one of them pointed to Christ. One was the anointing of David as king, 
And 2 Samuel 2, 7 verse 2 says, Out of the loins of David would come the Savior. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14 to be exact. The other was the famous Day of Atonement. The scapegoat that said, The Lamb of God is coming. John 1, 28. And the other was Ezekiel's famous Valley of Dry Bones, set in Babylonian captivity days, that said God's people re will be revived. So every one of the murals on that ancient synagogue, uncovered 1915, preserved from its ancient uh, origin, said Christ is coming. So the first S is scattering, because the Jews never ever, the majority of them never ever got back home. They intended to, but they remained in Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and finally scattered in the Roman Empire, dispersed. That was good, though, because now Abraham's seed spread all over the ancient Gentile world, and people who'd never heard of Christ and didn't have the law of Moses could now say the Savior's coming, and without bias and prejudice. And that brings us to the second word, synagogue. Christ and the apostles utilized this opportunity over and over and over again because they had sort of a freedom of religion there that if you came into their town, they might let you stand in the synagogue and read the scripture as they did Jesus in Luke chapter 4. And he read a passage from Isaiah 61 that predicted the Savior was coming, the Messiah. And when he finished reading, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And that Paul stand up in their synagogue, Acts 13. They didn't bargain for what he concluded through Christ is preaching to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him you can be forgiven of all things you couldn't be justified from by the law of Moses. Devout Greeks attached themselves to those synagogues. Now it was good. Because they listened without bias and prejudice. And in Acts 13, when the Jews wanted to kill Paul, the Gentiles said, we'll come back next Saturday and hear this same sermon again. So not only were God's people dispersed or scattered, there was a place to localize that where they could consistently each week listen to the prophecies concerning the Messiah. That leads us to the third word, Septuagint, S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T. -E the translation of the Old Testament dead letter Hebrew text into the common vernacular of Greek, which was the one language of the ancient world. Now, do you notice how everything is compressing itself toward the fullness of time? God's people are scattered among the heathen. Now, not just the Jews, but everybody knows the Messiah is coming. They have a place where this teaching is done in the synagogue. And then they have a translation that the Gentiles and all the world can understand, even the Jews. That came about in the year 280 B.C., 280 B.C. We'll talk a little bit about the library in Alexandria that these scholars used to translate from the Hebrew, which was a dead language, into the common vernacular of the ancient world, the common Koine Greek that the man on the street could understand. You know who demanded that translation? Believe it or not, Jewish parents. Jewish parents demanded it because their children taught in the Greek gymnasium schools that surrounded Judea and especially Jerusalem couldn't even understand the Bible their parents read. And so the Jewish parents begged scholars who knew Hebrew and Greek to take this Old Testament that pointed the coming of the Messiah and put it in understandable language for their children. Did you know that sheds a little light on Acts chapter 6? Have you ever wondered who those Grecian widows were that were complaining they were being neglected in the daily administration of benevolence? It didn't mean they were Greeks. Read the context. It meant that they were Hellenistic Jews. That is, they were Hebrews, but with Greek orientation. And they, their argument was, just because we're not true line Hebrews and may have a Septuagint translation, you're neglecting us. You're prejudiced toward us. We're Jews like you are, but we're Hellenistic. We're Grecian Jews. That helps you understand Acts 6. Just understand this. And in a semicircle around Judea were ten Greek cities called Decapolis, cities of ten. And there's where a lot of the people lived, and many of them were Jews in Gentile neighborhoods, if you please. Now that explains Mark chapter 5. Jesus, in the first four chapters of Mark, heals people and said, don't tell anybody. But in Mark 5, he heals the man who had been chained down to the tombs near the lake of Gennesaret in the land of the Gadarenes. He said, you go tell everybody. You know what the next verse says? He began to publish in all Decapolis, the mighty works of God, these ten Greek cities. 
Jesus was saying previous to that, I'm in a Jewish place, and if you go tell everybody, they'll want me to do nothing but heal, and I've come to teach them. I've come to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But over here at the Gentiles, I don't have time to get with them. You live in this area, you tell them. And so he began to publish in 10 Greek cities. And after that, when Jesus set his foot on their ground, they rushed to meet him even at the seashore. The man did his work well. That's how you understand those first five chapters of Mark. And you'll just, as a rule of thumb, when in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus healed someone and says, don't tell anybody you can or he's in a Jewish community. When he says, let everybody know it, he's in the Gentile area. You wouldn't understand that if you didn't understand this background. So scattering, synagogue, Septuagint, and that's good. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. In the year 375 B.C., we're stepping just a little ways from Malachi, just a little bit into these 400 silent years as far as the Bible's concerned. In the year 375 B.C., a man named Epicurus, a philosopher began to teach, man is holy, totally mortal. Therefore, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. In other words, when we die, we cease to exist, so you better have a rip and good time in this life. Jesus taught a parable about Epicurean in Luke chapter 12 and called him a fool. In Acts 17, when Paul reasoned on Mars Hill, he dealt with Epicureans and Stoics. Now, Epicurus himself was not Epicurean in his lifestyle. He didn't eat, drink, and be merry. He was a pretty austere fellow, but his students, his disciples, his pupils put out broadcast form what he taught, and then they began to practice it. And it was war against heaven and spiritual matters, the Epicurean philosophy. You know where the Stoics came from? Well, if the Epicureans came from Epicurus, they must have come from a fellow named Stoa. No. A man named Zeno of Athens, a front porch philosopher, taught from his front porch for 45 years in Athens, the opposite of Epicurean philosophy. He taught just to be good for goodness sake, not for God's sake, not for spirituality, but just a lifestyle that was calmer. His followers were called the people of the porch, and the Greek word for porch is stoa, so they were called the Stoics. And here is the background, the Epicureans and Stoics, that Jesus and the apostles confronted in the New Testament. About the year 350 B.C. begins a saga that is probably the most productive point on why it was the fullness of time when God sent his son, when he sent his son, why it was due time when Jesus came. A man named Socrates, a great humanitarian and philosopher, taught something so radical they made him drink a cup of poison to execute him. And you know what that radical thing was? He taught the Greeks to think for themselves. We take that for granted. But in the ancient world, the state did your thinking for you. Socrates had the audacity to say, God gave you a mind to think with. Use it. Think for yourself. Someone says, now, preacher, what does that have to do with the fullness of time in Christianity? What if no one had bridged that gap? When Christ and the apostles came, it wouldn't have done any good because they wouldn't think for themselves anyway when he taught them. Socrates said, think for yourselves. God gave you a brain, use it. It was so monumental that the Greek state said, we can't tolerate such insurrection, and forced him to drink a cup of poison to execute him. He had a pupil named Plato who went further than Socrates did. He said, it's not enough just to think. You need to think on a spiritual level. Every sermon in the book of Acts, every lesson Jesus taught, was based upon men thinking for themselves and thinking spiritually. Plato, about uh, 300 years before Christ, made a prediction that sounds very much like John chapter 1. He said, someday the Logos, the perfect one, will come, the epitome of heaven, the God-man, who will reveal to men what God in heaven wants them to know. He even used the same exact word referring to this one as John did in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, think, think spiritually. And Plato had a pupil that was more brilliant than both of the other predecessors. His name was Aristotle, but he was the most irreligious of all. He said, I don't care anything about thinking spiritually. I'm going to teach you how to think, whatever it is you think. And he gave the greatest rules of logic the world's ever known. And today, in schools of rhetoric and debate, Aristotle's rules of logic are still sanctioned as the highest ever given. 
You wouldn't have had the fullness of time if men hadn't been taught to think, think spiritually, and think logically. Every single sermon in the book of Acts, the book of conversions, deals with men think, think spiritually, and react logically to what we've said. Notice on the day of Pentecost, after Peter preached his sermon to men, teaching them to think and think on a spiritual level, he said, therefore. See, here's Aristotle's part. Therefore. Let's put all this together. Let all the house of Israel know, surely God had made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were convicted of sin, pricked in their hearts. It wouldn't have been previously. It wouldn't have even known how to be. It was the fullness of time. Because men have been taught to think for themselves, think spiritually, think logically. In the book of Daniel, after the Greeks had conquered the Medo-Persians, as Daniel 2.44 said they would, Alexander the Great came to the forefront a brilliant strategist. In fact, some people think that Alexander the Great and Field Marshal Rommel were the two greatest military minds that ever lived. I know one thing, at the age of 32, Alexander had conquered the ancient world and sat down and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. But he killed himself by being an alcoholic and by being just as wicked and licentious and debauched as a human being could be. He just took himself clear out of the arena of life. I'll tell you an interesting legend about him that must be a little more than legend. As he swept over the ancient world, he came to the outskirts of Jerusalem and intended to do the same with those people, just devastate them, Abraham's seed, that must be preserved when Jesus comes. But that night he fell into a deep stupor or slumber, had a dream. He dreamed that when he awakened, an entourage of people from Jerusalem would come out with all kinds of fruits and clothing and tributes and honors, and he'd be so impressed, he'd say, we'll leave these people alone. And sure enough, when he did awake from Jerusalem, came an entourage with all kinds of gifts and blessings and kindness, and he built into at least half of his empire a very gentle, cordial attitude toward Abraham's seed. According to Daniel chapter 7, when Alexander the Great would die, his kingdom would be divided into four parts, and that's just exactly what happened. And two of those four would be more dominant than the others. One were the Ptolemies of Egypt, who were very brilliant educators. They built that huge library in Alexander, Alexandria, from which the Septuagint translation was given. 72, that's how it gets its name, Septuagint. 72 brilliant scholars in Hebrew and Greek used the facilities and the books and the manuscripts and so forth and the scrolls from that great library of Philadelphia, one of the generals of the Ptolemies built in Alexandria. And shortly after the Septuagint translation was given, 280 years before Christ, that library burned to the ground. And many ancient historians say it was the greatest tragedy that happened in the ancient world. But God used it for a little while, while it did exist. Some of you may wonder why I'm putting so much importance on the Septuagint translation. Well, uh, beyond what we've already said, of how it took the Hebrew that was a dead letter into the Greek, which the children of the Jews knew. Beside that, Christ and the apostles quoted from it 85% of the time. 85% of the time when Christ and the apostles quoted from the Old Testament, they didn't quote the Hebrew text. They quoted the Septuagint translation. Very vital, very important. But the other part of uh, Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire was extremely wicked. Instead of being benefactors of society, the Seleucidans were vile and mean and forgot what Alexander said about being kind to Abraham's seed. In fact, they had a constant warfare against them. If you'll read carefully in Daniel chapters 9 and 11, you'll read of the abomination of desolation that was to take place. It was going to be led by an ungodly man that had no regard for God Almighty. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. That's why I told you not to take notes. That's hard to even pronounce, much less spell. But he was one of the vilest men who ever lived. He said his name meant the enlightened one, and the Jews said it means the mad dog. They hated him with a purple passion, and it was mutual. He despised them. He'd gone down into Egypt to battle, and word filtered back into Jerusalem in the year 168 B.C., that he died in battle there, and they had a parade right down Main Street. They were overjoyed. The mad dog was dead. They had banners and everything. But right in the middle of their proceedings, who would come in the middle gate but old Antiochus himself? Like Mark Twain said, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated, and he was furious. 
at June celebrating his death, and he wanted them to know he was going to do something to them they'd never, ever in the history of their world forget. And he accomplished that. He went into the temple and ordered swine's flesh to be offered on the altar. He built a monument to himself and demanded the Jews bow down to him instead of God and to offer something on the altar God had forbidden in the book of Leviticus. They call that the abomination of desolation, just like Daniel chapters 9 and 11 said they would. That took place on December 25th, 168 B.C. But Antiochus wasn't content with that. He sent soldiers out in the little villages outside Jerusalem to demand that the priests there offer swine's flesh on the altar and pay homage to him. Made a mistake, though, in sending a couple of soldiers out the little village of Modin, M-O-D-I-N, to an ancient priest named Mattathias who had four or five sons. He ordered swine's flesh to be offered on the altar, and one of Mattathias' soldiers or bodyguards jumped up, took the, Rome, took the soldier's spear out of his hand and quartered him, cut him in four parts right there in front of the altar. And thus began the famous Maccabean revolt because the fourth son of this man was Judas Maccabees, known in history, the hammerer. And he began a revolt, guerrilla warfare that I've read was the fiercest and most successful ever held. And for three years from the Judean hills, he and his soldiers magnificently fought and triumphed over the forces of Antiochus Epiphanes, the mad dog. And three years to the day, on December 25th, 165 B.C., they took Jerusalem, purged the temple, cleansed it, and the people called it the Feast of Dedication. That's what John 10, 22 means. So you wouldn't even know what John 10, 22 means. We haven't studied this. Men have a hard time being balanced, though. From that moment on, a terrible tragedy took place. Out of what they counted good came great harm. They began to give or sell to their military civil hero, like Judas Maccabees, the high priest office in Judaism, which the Levitical code said could only belong to the family of Aaron and only from the tribe of Levi. And now they are giving it or selling it to their military hero like Judas Maccabees. And they even have a legend when Judas dies. He's the greatest hero they've ever had. That thereafter, when they ever got in any trouble, old Judas would come back to life. They called it the Judas Revived Myth. That explains the triumphal entry of Jesus. Not since old Judas came along 165 B.C. had anyone so powerful come into their midst as Jesus of Nazareth. They'd try to capture him. He'd just walk right through them untouched, unscathed. Perform miracles they couldn't explain. He overwhelmed them with his power. They said, never a man so spake as he. When Messiah comes, what will he do that this man hadn't already done? If we don't get rid of him, the whole world will go after him. Read John chapter 7. So now, they're dominated by the Roman government. And they think he's Judas revived to deliver them from the bondage of Rome. And so they give him a triumphal entry. In fulfillment of Zechariah 9, but they weren't trying to fulfill prophecy. They were trying to butter their own bread. Fill their own nest. And when Jesus let it be known that he couldn't care less who ruled in a civil way, that he'd come to seek and save the lost, and they didn't think they were lost and that they didn't have any sins either. They want him to deliver them from Rome, and when he wouldn't do it, they hate him even more. And after the triumphal entry of Mark 11 and Matthew 21, they pressed him toward the cross as quick as they could get him there. The only way you can understand the triumphal entry is to get this background. As a result of giving or selling the high priest's office the highest bidder, there would naturally arise within Judaism a group of loyal stalwarts. They were called the Hasidim, H-A-S-I-D-I-M, the pure ones. Their point was, we will maintain Judaism, the Levitical code, and we're not going to give or sell this high priest's office and pollute Judaism, the Hasidim. It wasn't very long, though, till the popular seekers in the group, the Sadducees, said, we'll just play both ends against the middle and keep on doing this. A group arose and said, you will not, not without our disapproval. And they were called the separated ones, the Pharisees. We have really misunderstood the Pharisees. They were the best of the Jews, not the worst. Oh, they were wrong. 
and they added 1,100 traditions to the law, and Jesus helped them, but they were so much better than the Sadducees, there wasn't any contest. That's why Paul said, I was after the most accurate sect, a Pharisee. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm a Pharisee. Philippians 3, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He wasn't ashamed of that. That's the best Judaism had to offer. The separated ones. The pure ones. And that's the background. You've got to understand that. Well, where did the Herods and Caesars come from? In the year 200 B.C., a heroic character named Cato, the Roman senator, finished each year in the Roman Senate with these words emblazoned in the hearts of all his constituents. The last thing he'd say before they dismissed the Senate every year was, Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage was the last outpost of Grecian supremacy in northern Africa. He simply meant, Rome must dominate, Greece must fall. It took him 54 years to get the point across. I guess he was the Sam Rayburn of the Roman Senate. He lasted a long time. And in the year 146 B.C., Rome destroyed Carthage. And that fourth worldwide dynasty, Daniel foretold, was now set in motion. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom. All history is divided into two parts, B.C., before Christ, and A.D., which does not mean after the death of Christ. If it did, we'd have 33 and a half years unaccounted for. It comes from the Latin, Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. And all of history is dated from his advent in the world, not his death, but his birth. In Bethlehem of Judea, by the Virgin Mary, Micah 5, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 7, 14. Prophecy is going to be consummated. This is why it's the fullness of time. Prophecy is coming to a head. The fourth worldwide dynasty is there in the days of those kings. All roads led to Rome. Greatest highway system the world ever known. One universal language, Koine, common Greek, and now they have the Old Testament in that language. Rome has freedom of religion. They don't care who you worship or what. In fact, they're in Athens. They had idols erected, all kinds of gods, and then, P.S., if we've forgotten anybody, here's another one to the unknown God. Freedom of religion. You can believe and teach anything you want to as long as you didn't inflict the death penalty and gave answer for any uproar that happened in any of the communities of the Roman Empire to the Roman government. So freedom of religion, one language, great highway access. Men were thinking, thinking for themselves, thinking spiritually, thinking logically. For 100 years, Rome struggled to find a real leader. About the year 46 B.C., there was a gigantic tumultuous struggle vying for power between Julius Caesar and a Roman general named Pompey, P-O-M-P-E-Y. At a strategic time, on an important day, an idea man, an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, named Antipater, stepped into the fray and gave the balance of power to Julius Caesar. And he was so grateful, he said to Antipater, I'll give to you and your people, these half-breeds, descendants of Esau, half Jew, half world, I'll give to you and your people whatever you want, up to one-third of my kingdom. One-third of the Roman Empire, and two. Caesar's great surprise, the fellow said, all we want is the little vassal state of Judea. Just let us run Jerusalem. But he wasn't dumb. He did that for two reasons. He knew the richest place on earth per square inch was the temple area in Jerusalem. And if his people could control that, they'd have more money than they could count. And secondly, he could weave his way back into full allegiance to Judaism and no longer be a half-breed. And so began the strange, unique, one-of-a-kind in the history of the world alliance between the Caesars and the Herods because Antipater's son was none other than Herod the Great. And interweaving all the way through the life of Christ in the book of Acts is this strange alliance between the Caesars and the Herods. Can't understand the book of Acts if you don't know about that. You won't even understand what Paul was saying to Herod Agrippa in Acts 26 when he said, these things I'm talking to you about weren't done in a corner. I know you know these things. His point was, from your grand-grand-grandfather on back and all your uncles, you knew Jesus and you knew the apostles. You know I'm telling what's so. I know you believe these things. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Prophecy was being fulfilled. The right kingdom had come. Men could understand the book. 
They could understand logic. They could act logically and react to gospel preaching that demanded a reaction. In due time, Christ died of the ungodly. And I don't believe there's any way in this whole wide world we can understand a lot of the Bible if we don't understand this. But I want to read to you now. What timing? I'm telling you, I can't believe that. I must be a genius. No, I'm an idiot. I've brought out of everything I know to say. But listen real carefully. I don't want you to ever forget this. It's one of the brilliant speeches and the unsung speech in the Bible. Luke 2, 25 to 35. Aged Simeon has an honor he never dreamed he'd live to see. He's going to hold the Messiah in his arms. This is when Mary and Joseph, poor people, come to offer two turtle doves. They don't have a sheep. They're very poor. Verse 25 of Luke 2. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came with the Spirit in the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. In Genesis twenty-two eighteen, 18, God said to Abraham, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Galatians three sixteen says, Unto thy seed, which is Christ, in due time, Christ died of the ungodly. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven set up a kingdom. And so, 1 Peter 1 says the prophets foretold this, but didn't live to see it. The angels desire to look into it, but we're the recipients of it. Thank God for these 400 silent years that would weave together so many things the Old Testament said. And in Luke 3, 5, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Joel chapter 2, he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And in Acts chapter 2, in the days of the Roman kings, when the God of heaven set up his kingdom, Peter says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Joel 2, Daniel 2, and Isaiah 2, where all nations in Jerusalem heard the law of the Lord and flowed into the kingdom. In the fullness of time, God sent forth their son. We've just touched on some of the major epical points, and another time we'll go into it more fully. I'm glad we're studying the life of Christ on Sunday morning because we're tying all these things together. And when we finish with Mark 13 and get into Mark 14 this coming Sunday morning, you're going to see a lot of what we've said tonight come to fruition. It's just building. But remember how blessed we are. History divided into two parts, before Christ and from the time he made his advent into the world. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son.